Welcome to Camera Shake Podcast, episode 86. And before you get into this, just be reminded that uh, you can join our community over at our website. That's camerashakepodcast.com. Um, hit the join the community button where you can hear the latest news um, and all the best of that the Camera Shake Podcast has to offer. Absolutely. Absolutely. Totally behind the scenes. We've got some, uh, as we mentioned in last week's um, episode, we've got some new stuff coming out very soon. So, um, that would be quite interesting. So head over to cameratechpodcast.com. Just remember to hit the join the community button. We would appreciate it very much. Now, what's been new this week? I'm feeling festive. <laughs> That's what's new. So for those of you only listening on audio, I'm currently wearing my Star Wars Christmas jumper. Yes, I'm wearing my yeah. red. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, that, that Czech stormtrooper that well, they've got. Exactly. Yeah? Exactly. <laughs> oh, man. I went to the mall. I tell you what. Ugh. I went to the we're, mall the other day. We're in England. What, okay. What shopping it? center anyway, over yeah, here. So I went to the shopping center the other day. <laughs> so anyway, so I went to the mall and, um, and I, was, uh, I was jumped upon by a Polish lady selling paintball tickets, like paintballing okay. tickets. Okay. Right. Right. And uh, it's probably, I mean, it's the most intense sales tactics <laughs> I've experienced in a long time. It was literally, you know, myself, my wife, and, you know, my youngest daughter were walking in. And there she is going like, you know, do you want to shoot your wife? And I'm like, yes, sometimes I do. <laughs> God. And this is how the conversation started. Uh, uh, you know, and then of course, it's like she wrote me into this, this conversation about these, uh, these paintball events, right? And uh, it, the, the sales thing went from like, you know, trying to rope us in. She's, she's going to be like really quick, like super quick. And then of course, the whole conversation took like 10 minutes. And it had like every sales trick mm -hmm. in the book. I'm like, oh, are you here until Christmas? I might come back. Oh, no, today's the last day, you know? Of course it is. Of course it is. Always is. Go back tomorrow. Yeah, well, they're probably still there. Catch her out. Exactly. But one of the interesting things I thought was that, you know, they have these different um, gameplays. You know, this is like, they have several paintball centers across the country or whatever. And so, you know, you can like, I don't know, uh, conquer a pirate ship or, you know, invade a medieval castle type of thing. Mm -hmm. But yep. they also have the Star Wars setup. With stormtroopers. Right. Okay. So that is interesting. So you signed up. Well, <laughs> no, well, I didn't, but I wanted to. Ah, I see. <laughs> like it. Yeah. That reminds me of doing the, um, it must have been a Westfield in uh, White City. All right. Um, they did a Star Wars virtual reality. Ooh, okay. Where you're stormtroopers. Ooh, nice. And you've got the VR headsets on, you've got the... Stormtrooper gun and yeah. all of that, and you look around, you're completely immersed. Got, yeah. You know, it's heat going on, movement, all of that kind of stuff. And uh, that was pretty superb. Is that similar to like the Disney experience where you have like the full yeah. like sensory feedback and all that kind of stuff? Is that what it I is? I believe so. It's very oh. similar. It was very similar. This was a few years ago now right. um, when I did this. And um, I just remember one bit where you're standing, uh, there was four of us. Mm. We're, you're, sta you're supposed to be standing on the platform probably about the size of the table that's in front of yeah. us right now. And, um, you know, it feels like it's moving and whatnot. And it, cause it, you are going over a, it kind of flies across like lava or something right. like that. And you've got the heat coming in the wind, that kind of stuff. Mm. But I almost felt sick. Right. Cause I would never be able to do that in real life, anything like that. Yeah. And it just, cause I felt so close to the edge. I just, I had to glance down underneath the visor that you right. had on to just, Stop myself throwing up. Yeah. <laughs> it was really weird. How, I mean, how real is it? Well, it's computer game graphics, but right. you know, not great computer game graphics. Right. Okay. But real enough to, um, to be really enjoyable. I did a virtual reality experience thing, um, at Thor Park, mm -hmm. maybe a couple of years ago. It was a Darren Brown experience. Oh yeah. Have you ever, have you heard about that? No, I like him No, It's yeah. I mean, it's, it's sort of, it's a little psycho. Uh, it's basically you're in a tube train. Mm -hmm. right with vr headsets but basically you walk into the set and you put the headsets on um and then you get all the you know the experience as if the, the train is moving yep um and then all of a sudden like zombies and stuff crashing through the windows and you get you know and all that kind of stuff and, cool um and then eventually i think the train breaks down or something and you get to evacuate or something like that. it's pretty crazy but it kind of feels at least at the time well so here's the thing so at the time it felt relatively real Mm -hmm. But I think the more often you do stuff like that, the more sort of fake it feels. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. 
It's a little bit like CGI, like the early beginnings of CGI, like when Jurassic Park first came out, you know, I remember like seeing this in the 90s, whatever, early 90s, whenever it came out, they're like, wow, this is incredible. This looks so real. And of course, yeah. now you watch it and you go like, well, man, this is terrible. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I think Jurassic Park still holds up. The original one. Mm. The original one. Yeah. There's this, there's this scene where Sam Neill. Because a lot of them were still animatronics and big life-size life-sized yeah but it, the cgi well. there's a cgi scene like for instance um that at the time you know it was like being hailed for being so super realistic like there's like sam neil and his crew basically on on the plane somewhere and then there's this there's this herd of brontosaurus or yeah. something do you remember like yeah like running like basically running past them and stuff like that and that was all cgi oh no they were like they're on, on like two feet weren't they those are little dinosaurs on two feet they were running past weren't they Oh no! I mean, yeah. I mean, I'm talking about the big, like the big oh, okay. ones in the in that scene, like or whatever it was. But I remember, yeah, like yeah. at the time, it's like, oh man, it looks so real, and it did. You know, yeah. if you're coming out of freaking Harry Herringhausen, do you know they you know? they were originally going to do all of that in stop motion? Were they? Yep, they were, and they tried it out, and it looked rubbish. <laughs> well, right? I'm surprised. And, and admittedly, I, you, you're seeing that back now, so it is going to look extra kind of rubbish given yeah, what yeah. we used to see oh, today I mean, but it, it did not look good yeah. to the point where um who was whoever was working on some kind of graphics for the film mm. they were told you know not to do it and they what they did was they they thought oh, we can do that mm. and they'd never done it it's never never been done before yeah. so they created a skeleton of a dinosaur and they were doing a quick screening for something else mm -hmm. and they and they would because they were told not to do it mm. all they did was they just left it they left it playing on a monitor oh, okay. in the screening room nice. and just didn't mention it. Right. And then Spielberg came over to it and saw it. Mm. Said, what's, what's that? I want that. That's what I want. Nice. And that's, that's how they started doing it. Cool. Yeah. That was the, wasn't it the most expensive movie at the time? The first movie that broke the $100 million production really? budget or something? Oh, I think so. Yeah. 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 Good film. Yeah, it was a good, good, good film. Yeah, it's a film. new one coming up. With Sam, is that? Sam Neill, isn't it? Oh, is he? Oh, by the way, you know Sam Neill. I've got a, I've got a bone to pick about Sam Neill because I actually quite like him as an actor. No pun intended. Well, well. yes. Um, <laughs> see, segue. Yes. <laughs> um, so there's, um, there's a new, well, relatively new uh, show out on Apple TV called Invasion. Mm -hmm. It's been out probably for about eight weeks or something. I think, it's, I think that's where we are probably about episode eight or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, it's basically an alien invasion show, a typical kind of thing. Aliens invade, you know. Um, Earth and whatnot, and basically it's told from the the uh, the viewpoints of I think five different groups of characters. So there's like a family, and then there's like some um, soldier, and then there's Sam Neil, who's uh, I believe a sheriff or a police officer or something somewhere in the Midwest, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and they all experience the whole invasion thing in in their own ways and at some point later on as it usually happens with these sort of things their paths cross right all right so that was it was built on that yo sam neil's in it da, da, you know yeah he's in the first episode i'm in episode eight i haven't seen him again excellent <laughs> like every week my wife and i are sitting like do you think sam is gonna be in this one nope <laughs> he's done isn't he yeah. well i mean you know what is that what's that all about he probably did one and then for this is crap. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing it anymore. Yeah, I mean, it was promising. You know, when we saw the trailers, it was a, it was promising. And then you start watching, and you kind of go, "They do this thing. It's a little bit like, um, what was it? Like Jaws? You know, where you where you spent like three quarters of the movie, and you never actually see the monster. Mm. And that's supposed to be what builds up the tension. You know, la la la. Um, the thing is, like, you don't really get to see any of the aliens until like episode seven or something. All right. You know. And then when you finally see them, you're going to go, they're really underwhelming. Excellent. You know, that's, that's, well, that's yeah. what I've been waiting for. So, that, so that's where they cut the budget. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. So it was, yeah, it's, um, I don't know. It's not necessarily a damn, what's it called? A, a damp squid, squib, a damn squib. It's, it is squib, isn't it? Is it sh squib. Squib. Squib? It is squib. I want to say like whip, but it doesn't work. Cool whip. <laughs> yeah. Damn whip. Cool whip. <laughs> anyway. Oh so, yeah. If if you are into Invasion on Apple TV, let us know if you know better. Um, but to be fair, I haven't seen last week's episode yet. So, yeah, cool. um, But, yeah. Um, 
That's pretty much. Well, other than that, I've been watching a lot about the Beatles. Don't shh, still haven't started it. <laughs> Don't talk about Ongoing that thing. Um, but yeah. Oh, okay. So I had a real nightmare at a shoot last night. What could possibly have happened? Uh... <laughs> like one of many things. <laughs> What did you break? <laughs> uh, man, so, okay. I've already had a massive rant about this earlier today, but, you know, anyway, let me explain again. Um, so I did, um, I did a boxing shoot yesterday, right? And imagine, typically, you know, there's the way this works. You've got the ring and, you know, the ring is lit. And clearly the ring has to be lit well because there are two people in there beating the living daylights out of each other, mm-hmm. right? So, I mean, it's... In their favor, if things are lit well, because if it isn't, then you know you got a problem there. Um, but also from a photography point of view, you need a lot of light because you gotta, you know, you have to deal with relatively high shutter speeds, um, and so you know, you, you know, you need it to be lit well. Sure. Anyway, the lighting company that was meant to um, to do this uh, didn't turn up or went to the wrong place. There was, still, I think, there was a change in date um, as far as the event was concerned. And, Anyway, they had to get some other company in last minute. And so they rocked up with two poles, lighting the whole ring with two LED lights. That's it. That's it. That is it. That was the only light in the whole flipping venue with these two little LEDs. And I'll tell you what, they're, they are smaller than the LEDs that we use for video production. They were literally this big. Really? Yeah. You need like blood lights in places like well, that. Well, oh, so, but here's the thing. So as I was, you know, I had a, um, I think I was shooting over 20 fights, right? And as I started shooting, you know, after the first fight, I looked back through some of the images and I'm like, why is, why are two out of three images literally black? And at some images, the bottom half was, was black. Some images, the top half was black. Some images were completely black. And so every, I think every fourth image or something was, was you know, halfway decently underexposed because overall there wasn't enough light in the ring anyway, right? Okay. But at least you could see everything. And I'm, you know, I'm freaking out because I'm thinking, damn, my shutter assembly is done. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, <laughs> God. <laughs> you know, that's it. Damn it. And, uh, you know, and I'm like, but I can't be, you know. There are certain, um, certain shots um, you have to take with the speed light. I mean, clearly, as you're shooting the fight itself, you can't use the speed light mm-hmm. because that would totally distract the people yep. in the ring, right? Um, but there are certain, certain shots you take with, uh, with the speed light, as mainly the boxes coming in, or you're walking in, and also um, when the, the ref, or whatever it's called in boxing, I never know, um, announces the winner at the end, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and It is ref, but let's go with umpire. Yeah, umpire, whatever. <laughs> I don't know. The man in black. Very nice guy, by the way. Anyway, so so I'm looking at like two, three fights in. I'm looking at. I'm thinking this is bizarre. Like all of the images I'm taking with the speed light are fine, as they should be, but whenever I'm shooting with without the speed light, like during a fight, everything's all screwed up. Mm-hmm. And then it dawns on me: it's the bloody LEDs. They're um. Uh, what's it, what would it be called? Refresh rate, is it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So they're refresh rate. They're basically, basically, so what happens is, you know... Were they cheap? Did they look well, cheap? Well, they must have been, yeah. yeah. They're <laughs> tiny. So basically, what happens is, you know, LED lights um, are not constant, constant. They appear to be constant because they're literally refreshing so quick that you can't yeah. see it with the naked eye. So it is what appears to be constant light, but it's not. It's just a very fast flash for the, you know, for the lack of a better word. But so the way they're refreshing is... Uh, they don't, it's not that all LEDs refresh at the same time. It's the bottom half that refreshes and the top half that refreshes, and then you get a completely... Well, they kind of cycle through. Yeah, that. they cycle through, right? Gotcha. Exactly. Okay. So that must have... Exactly. Because that way, that's why some of my, fri- some of my frames were, were basically black at the bottom half and you know, and, so, and vice versa and so on and so forth. So, so then it dawns on me that there's literally virtually nothing I can do about that. Zero. Like, unless somebody listening to this has any better idea... But, um, you know, the only thing you can do, basically, is shoot a lot more images mm-hmm. in the hope, you know, you're basically playing a numbers game. So you're kind of thinking like, well, if I shoot, you know, 200 images for, per, per like three rounds or something, 
you know, then, then I might get some that are halfway decent keepers. But then this whole, you know, this whole refresh thing, you know, it, it, it screws with your autofocus system and all the rest of that. It really is a nightmare. Absolute nightmare, I shoot. And that went on for over 20 fights. That's, uh, dealt with. <laughs> you know. See, you want to walk out and say, I'm just, I'm just not doing this, but you've got to be pro. Uh, and the thing is, you know, <clears throat> I mean, other, other than the fact that I think, in generally speaking, the ring was underlit, which couldn't have been great for the people fighting. Well, yeah, it must have been if they only had two, you know, two um, LED panels. Exactly. And so, you know, it wasn't like, I, I didn't think it looked great. The rest of the hall was completely, the rest of the venue was completely dark. <laughs> right. Completely dark. So the only thing that was lit was actually the ring in the middle, um, underlit. You know, so that was one thing. Um, but also, you know, you can really, you, you really can't produce any good imagery of, of, of that event at all. No. You know? No. Unless there's something I'm seriously missing. And, who, you know, if you guys listening to this, you know, um, have any better ideas, did <laughs> you know, you, chime in. <laughs> did you play with your shutter speed to see yeah, if that helped? Yeah, I, I did. I mean, I tried the whole thing. I kind of thought, well, this is, this is either going to be pulsing at 50 or 60 hertz, basically, blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. So I tried any multiple of that. None of that works. The, the problem is, of course, you're sort of you're limited because on one hand, you need to uh, keep the shutter speed reasonably high because you need to be able to freeze the action. Mm-hmm. And you need to make sure, because people in the ring actually move really fast. And, you know, when they're swinging their fists around, you know, their boxing gloves move very, very fast. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, so ideally, I mean, ideally you want to be above, I'd say a minimum of 400, 500, maybe a thousand if you can, you know, um, of thousandth of a second um, in order to really freeze that. Um, it kind of means you have to push the ISO up. ISO 1 billion. <laughs> well, I was shooting at ISO 8,000 all night long. Wow. Yesterday, because we saw it on the lid. Wow. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, ugh. it's a bit of a nightmare cool. and a head scratcher, you know, and, and actually, you know, also a bit of a panic because I thought my equipment was failing. And Absolutely. Out, out of interest, how many images did you end up taking or compared to normal? So a typical, I took like probably, that. I took probably just under 3000 images. Um, <laughs> and that's about, that's double compared to what I would normally take. Cause I had a, I had a look at um, a similar fight that did pre pandemic actually, this is the first boxing, um, event i've done since but yeah it's about double and so you've had to manually go through those one by one and delete the black half black images yeah you you basically pick the keepers is there any way to filter that other no. than like quick way there no. isn't is there there isn't no and the thing is like because it's so because you're shooting such a high iso um you know even if you bring the shadows up on that or the exposure up to any meaningful extent, you immediately going to increase the noise to, mm -hmm. to the point where you, they're completely unusable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? And, um, I mean, although, generally speaking, I was really impressed um, with the Nikon sensor. Um, it w I mean, it was, generally speaking, ha handling that as a range really quite well in comparison to just about any other camera I've ever used. Mm. Um, so that in itself was, probably what saved the whole thing. Um, so, and you're provided... When I had images that were just by chance actually lit well and in focus, because that's the other thing, <laughs> then so you've probably come away with an image <laughs> out of all of those. I, well, I mean, it's you know, it's frustrating. What a nightmare! Well, it's frustrating because the, you know, if you think the keepers, for instance, on that, um, although I shot twice as many images as I would ordinarily shoot at an event like that, the keep they're less. They're, I mean, there are much fewer keepers in there than yeah. than I would have ordinarily. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and the fact that you have to, I mean, literally you have to manually go through the whole shebang. So that means, you know, that meant I went home la late last night, um, and then it was basically, you know, spent, well, I managed to get through half of them by about one, one thirty yeah. or something in the morning. Trouble with this stuff is it's trying to explain to the client why, what's going, why this is happening, why there are fewer keepers this, this time round. Sure. And them understanding it because it just looks, it's ultimately going to look bad on you because yeah, you haven't absolutely. got the, got the shots right, well, and it's nothing to do with you. And the thing is, like you know, like as far as the lighting people were concerned, they probably thought, okay, well, we're just going to put two LEDs in the ring, and you know, everybody can see, and that'll be it. But actually, but you know, from a photographic point of view, that completely ruined it. Absolutely, you know, um, I don't know if. I mean, I guess, you know, from a, from a 
lighting tech's point of view, as long as you get light in there, you're probably happy. You don't really think about anything else. No, you wouldn't think about a photographer. Yeah. No, 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 it's no. Just, um, as long as everybody can see the fight, that's that's their remit, yeah. right? That's all extremely, they've got to do. Extremely frustrating. Um, so, yeah. Did you make them aware? On, I on did, the night yeah. I did. For future reference, just so you know, this is what happens with these lights. Yeah, I did. I mean, I did speak to one of the organizing team afterwards and basically said, you know, these... Well, I just explained what was going on there. Yeah. You know. Um, Next yeah. time you're at one be with the regular lighting company, try and clock what they're using instead. Well, so, I mean, normally it depends. It depends on the venue. I mean, sometimes the venue has its own lighting system. You know, it's mm. fine. Like some of the big theaters that they're in, usually, um, you know, they're completely kitted out. This was a big sports hall mm -hmm. that probably held about, I guess, there were probably a thousand people in it, but I mean, give or take, you know, something like that. Um, and maybe 800 people, mm -hmm. um, and you know, the ring in the middle and, um, yeah. And that was it. So, you know, the actual, the actual whole lighting was terrible. It was just a well, yeah. sports hole. Yeah. Lighting, you know? Fluorescent nastiness. Yeah, exactly. Mm. So, you know, it was funny when I turned, when I turned up, you know, an hour and a half or something before the event started. And all the, the main lights were on. And, you know, I remember saying to him, like, what's the, and there were, there were no lights set up on the, on the ring. So I just, you know, I just went to the organizer and we're like, okay, so what's the lighting going to be like for the ring? And he was like, oh yeah, it's going to be fine. We've got a company coming in, you know. I was a bit of a last minute thing, but, you know, the ring's always well lit, you know. And, and I went, <laughs> okay, fine. Okie doke. And the other thing was, it was really annoying, is that they set up these LEDs on poles, but the poles weren't tall enough. Because the ring is about, I mean, the ring's about a meter high. The, the floor of the ring. Yeah, the floor yeah, of the ring yeah. is about, sort of three, yeah, yeah. well, at least yeah, about three foot or something mm -hmm. off the ground. So, and these poles were probably another, there weren't even, but if you were stood on the, on is, the floor of the ring. Is it ropes around it or cage? Ropes. Ropes. Yeah. yeah. So they're basically on opposite corners, or so two LEDs on opposite corners of the ring. Um, and... They were probably not even six foot off of the the ring floor. So really, yeah. So you can see how. I mean, they were too low anyway. You know. So which I'm guessing, like, if you were fighting that ring, you would have been blinded depending on which direction you'd be looking. Yeah. At, you know. But also that, oh, that needs to come from a but high above. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So they weren't high enough. Oh, um, God. Not powerful enough. <laughs> They were refreshing like crazy. Oh, and God. Uh, and it really. It know, sounds like they just called up the local pub and go, "You got got any lights you can bring down?" I don't know. What a shame. The music was extremely loud. Maybe they were focusing on that. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. Man, super annoying. That's awful. Yeah. So that was that was my that was my um my you know shoot nightmare mm. yesterday. By the way, if you have any. Um, photo shoot nightmares uh, you want to tell us about that'd be super interesting too photo shoot nightmares photo shoot nightmares there should like be a segment that. there should be yeah. a segment <laughs> of this show <laughs> um, yeah but that'd be good um, that'd be interesting to hear so you know have you come across anything um, you know similarly annoying um, and how did you deal with it at the time because that's I think that's ultimately what it boils down to is well, that's, like, that's it isn't it you know how you overcome how you these. respond to, yeah, yeah. It's using all of your knowledge and everything you've experienced ever since you picked up a camera to try and combat yeah. a problem. Well, and also, you know, keep, you know, keep it calm yeah. in that situation because... Yeah, it's nothing, you, it's out of your control yeah. at the end of the day. I, mean, I figured the only thing I could do was, was really just shoot more. Yeah. You know, because you have to get some keepers I mean, for what's gonna, what, are, what are the other options? Change out the lights? That's not going to happen. No. <laughs> and you know, the really frustrating thing, actually, I mean, apart from everything else, um, when I looked through the images, you know, there were a few really awesome shots in there that are completely unusable. Mm. You can just about see what's happening. Like, you know, I mean, some really, really awesome shots. As far as boxing is concerned, you always want to get those shots, you know, where the glove connects with the face, for example, you know, something like that. And you can see some real like emotion in somebody's face, um, you know, stuff, stuff like that. It was some really, really, really mm. cool shots. And they're just all for the bin. Well, that Mm. The cutting room floor, as they say. Oh. Just don't look at them. <laughs> just don't. They're really frustrating. Yeah. You know. So actually delete those ones, otherwise you'll just get upset. That made me cry nearly. That's what I was saying. <laughs> oh yeah. dear. I'd pay to have seen that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you gotta keep it together, you know, that's the thing. Yeah, um absolutely. 
So yeah, but it was a good workout. My my legs are raging their revenge today. Yeah. So, but you've been squatting. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because that's the thing. I mean, not only do you run around a lot, because here's the thing, yeah. right? What, this yeah. is like purely for you know, if you if you've never shot uh, boxing fights um, yourself, then then here's one thing to consider. You know, as a photographer, you always want to get the best angle, obviously, mm-hmm. right? You always want to be where you can see people's faces. Because if they're turned with their backs to you, it's pointless because you see all you see yeah. the backs, right? On the back my, of the head. my assumption is that whenever that quality shot is about to happen or that moment, they've just turned and they're back oh, to you. I'm yeah, assuming yeah. that's always the, thing, the case. Plus, you know, the thing is like <laughs> these things move so fast that, that really, you know, you can't really predict where they're going to end no, up. No. You know, you just have to basically say, I'm going to stay on this side for a little while and I'm going to move over to the other side. Yeah. You know, and yep. so on. Um, but the referee also wants to have the best angle because for obvious reasons, because you need to see what's going on. Mm. So literally, whenever something happens, it'd be guaranteed that that dude is going to be between you and the fighters. Yeah. So it's always yeah. blocking what you're trying yeah. to shoot. Um, what lens do you use for these? Um, so, I mean, with this, it's a typical 24 to 70 yep. kind of a thing. Yeah. Yeah, because you, you, sort of you need to get you need to be fairly wide, but you also need to come in close enough so that you can get, you know, like a detailed yep. close-up shot of a face or something like that. These boxing rings are, I mean, they're not, they look bigger on TV than they actually are. Mm. Mm-hmm. So, you know, 24-70 is... More than enough. More than enough. Yeah. You could kind of, you know, you could kind of argue maybe a 24 to 110 or something like that might be good. The problem there is, is that you need to really shoot at the widest aperture mm. yep. because of the lighting conditions in general. Um, so you don't really have the luxury of of using like I think I have a twenty four to one ten. It is like a F four or something. That just wouldn't cut it. Yeah, in it at all. Yeah. Um, you know, the other way you could do it is maybe to shoot with two bodies and have two primes in there. Mm-hmm. You know, um, maybe that could work. But then you have to switch all the time. And I, I tell you, I mean, it's so fast moving that even switching camera bodies is just you just lose so much time. Yeah. And they're short rounds, right? Yeah, they're short rounds. And they literally, I mean, with this sort of event, it's basically three rounds and that's it. And then, you yeah. know, then the judges make a decision. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's the only way you get through like 20, 22 fights a night. Mm. You know. Um, and it's, you know, it's physically challenging because you're running around a lot. And you're jumping up and down the ring and you're climbing up and, you know. So um, and there's lots of shots you have to get in between. And it's like speed light on, speed light off, blah, blah, blah you know. Mm. Um, it's really just pretty constant. Over well, how long's that event? Hmm? Three or four hours? Yeah, I think all all in probably about four hours. Yeah, so, huh. yeah, I'd be I'd be knackered after that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's even more frustrating when then you have to go home and he's like, "Oh man, I'm like now I've got to actually look through like two and a half thousand images yeah, yeah. to find like, you know, th- the small number of keepers." Yeah. Well, you come talk to me when you've had to uh, hold a heavy camera on a gimbal uh-huh, for eight yeah. hours straight in the yeah. pissing rain. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, no, that's true. That's true. I was actually trying to, I tell you, as I was walking out of the venue, I was actually trying to FaceTime you last night because I was, I was fuming, man. I was like, oh, this is what that was. <laughs> but yeah. Um, I didn't see that missed call till today, actually. Because I was, but, I had no reception at the time. Yeah, you would have just, you, you would have just gotten the full rent, I think, at that point. <laughs> Hilarious. You know. Hilarious. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Cool, man. But that's honestly, you know, it's the first time I've had that issue with LED lights. Mm. I've, I've literally never come across this before. Um, but it's this, you know, as you can tell, that's I mean, the first see, time well, you, I see flicker on video and whatnot, you, you, you can imagine. Yeah. Um, but you can dial your shutter speed into like fractions as yes. well. Yes, correct. Um, which can. It usually takes care of yeah. business on that. That's true. It's different with video. Yeah. Because, oh, yeah, 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 because yeah, yeah. the thing yeah. is like, of course, yeah. you know, when you're shooting stills, you know, what is relevant is when you hit the shutter button relative to the mm-hmm. the refresh yeah. sequence totally. of, of the of yeah. the LED, you know. So there's really no way. If it's continuous, it's different because it'll just scan it and it'll basically match it and yeah. that's all cool. And then everything henceforth will be the same. Yeah. But um the yeah. R doesn't the R three and the Z nine automatically do that? 
There's an auto feature for that. I think for doing this on shutter speed for for video. video. Yeah, I think the I don't know if it's Pretty an auto sure. feature or whether it's something that you can tell it to do or something. Yeah, yeah, I think you just go, hey, check this out, right. deal with it, and it'll save it for you. Yeah, for video, it's a beautiful. That's thing. That's very cool. I like yeah. that. Yeah, I like that. It detects the flicker. But flicker. There you go. Flicker. That's the word. <laughs> flicker. <laughs> Is it, isn't Flipper an old antiquated photo platform? Flipper? No, Flicker. Yeah, Flicker. Flicker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. F L I K R. Oh, they yeah, spell maybe. it. Odd, didn't they? Yeah. No, I didn't. No, 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 no. I think I may have had a Flicker. No, I never had Flicker. Um, don't use Vimeo. Oh yeah, none of that stuff. It's all nah. Not interested. Yeah, I wonder whether. I wonder how Tumblr. We... Tumblr. Yeah. Remember that Tumblr? Vaguely, I've definitely never had a Tumblr account. Yeah, no, 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 no. no. I, don't I, don't think, I don't even think I had a MySpace account. I did, yeah. But my MySpace mm. was a thing. I think it should be a thing again. I, should, I think we should we should set up a camera shake in MySpace account. Brilliant. <laughs> because I checked it out the other day. Um, as I was, I don't know, for some reason, my daughter and I were talking about MySpace, and it's still in existence. Yeah. Oh yeah, still yeah. there. So yeah, yeah. if you, <laughs> as you are, this, you know, I always wonder why um, people have um, accounts on these platforms like Tumblr or Flickr or something. But if you, you know, if you're listening to this, if you have one, it'd be really interesting. Um, to understand why, yeah, you know, uh, like yeah. what's what's the benefit over something like let's say Instagram for example, or yeah, something like that, you know, um, and it's just really because actually I don't really have that much experience with no I don't with I don't platforms, no. so I don't either, you know, no. maybe there's something I'm missing. I'm here to be educated, <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> not only to absolutely educate but also to be educated. Yeah, yeah. I have some good news. You're pregnant. Not yet. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> Trying. <laughs> right. Um, tell you, the amount I've eaten recently. <laughs> the, the turkey baby. Trust me, it's really, I'm, I'm, I've just given in to being overweight until after Christmas now. Right. Well, you okay. know what? Welcome to the club. Stick with it. <laughs> um, my new MacBook. Okay. The all singing, all dancing M1 Max. Right. Has finally reached the UK. Oh, okay. It left China f- four days ago. Or got picked up in Shanghai, um, wherever oh. Apple is out there, where it gets made. And it's finally reached here. So I'm kind of hoping it'll be out for delivery tomorrow or what day is it say? Uh, tomorrow or the day after anyway. Right. How, um, how long ago did you order this? Middle, 21st of October. Oh, wow. Okay. It was originally supposed to be here two weeks ago and it got delayed. Right. Like, just demand. Had I ordered it two weeks before I ordered it, mm. when it got announced at the start of October, or was it a week, 10 days, whatever it might be, mm. I would have had it within a week. Oh, really? Yep. But because so, uh, they had so many orders, they oh, there's only, okay. there's only so, so just, much. So it's just demand that was the... Purely demand, yeah. Yeah. Cool. And I can't wait. Yeah. So I'm going to be testing that out. Um, as my, I don't think everything that I use is going to work on it yet, um, because not everything's 100% compatible with silicon yet. Um, with the M1 chips. Okay, but this is the this is the M2 chip, isn't it? Or is it? It's M1. Right. Okay. So it's the first M chip. What was it called? But, no, M2 doesn't exist yet. Isn't out there yet. So what's the difference between? So you got M1, yeah. which is what came out last year. Right. You got M1 Pro. Oh, M1 Pro now, was, yeah. which is significantly better than the M1 already. Mm. And then you have got the M1 Pro Max right. or the M1 Max, whatever they call it, which is again. More cores, more GPU cores, right. all of that kind of stuff. It's got two um, uh, uh, H, uh, yeah, two six four and two six five decoders and encoders in it. So it's twice as, as fast as okay. even the M one Pro uh, um, exporting video, right? Which is very cool. I mean, that's, I guess. I, I mean, I guess for you, that's the main issue is, you know, how it handles video essentially. Absolutely, that's where, and that's the downfall of every laptop. Mm is how it handles video i mean my, my current one which is the last intel one they did the 2019 mm. yeah it's like eight core i9 or whatever it is um it's all right yeah i don't think it performs nearly as good as it's supposed to well so your current macbook pro is pretty much i mean it's very similar to my iMac, isn't it like in terms of i think mine's eight core i believe yours is 10 core no idea Pretty sure. I, I, I'm pretty sure it is, mm. and I think you've got a faster clock speed. Right. Um, anyway, because I mean, gen- I mean, generally speaking, 
So your 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 iMac is definitely better than my MacBook. Yeah, I mean by by quite some way, if I remember rightly. Right. Because I'm quite. I mean, I'm, I'm still quite happy with it. Yeah. You know, there's, there's no at the moment. It's the clock speed. It's no. it's because those the one I got is only a two point four eight, but it's got eight cores, which is great. Right. But I I don't know the technical side of all of that. I don't really look at it enough. Mm. But if you've got a three gigahertz processor with less cores than I do, you're going to perform better. Mm. I I believe. Um, I don't I've got nothing to back that up. I don't know if that's accurate or not. Mm. Maybe someone out there can tell us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but the the reason that these new these M1 chips are so f- big reason why they're so fast is because it's all integrated together. Mm. The GPU, the pro, the CPU, and the your your memory, your RAM, is all part of the same thing. Mm. And there's just super fast speeds between them. It's just unreal. It's absolutely unreal. I'm expecting probably to be able to do stuff twice as fast yeah. on this as I'm doing today. Those were the days when we were like processing audio or MIDI actually on the old Atari ST 1040. Nice. <laughs> nice. You know, that complicated and high CPU load MIDI information. Oh yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Love it. With your um, 10 kilobit hard drive. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. That. Oh, but back in the day, man, mm. that's, that's where it was at. Yeah. But I will, I'm going to do my own, there's a thousand videos out there on speed testing these new Macs and right. comparing it to whatever they're comparing it to, a um, whole host of stuff like that. But I'm going to do my own personal tests because I know what I do. Mm. I know how I work with it. And I'm just going to do exactly the same operations a few times on both and just really see what benefit I'm you getting. You know what would be interesting in terms of video, like let's say if you had, let's say you made a like a one minute video, let's say, mm-hmm. and you rendered the same project on both and clock them both to see how yeah well you know exactly. what the difference is basically yeah and you do it like with a one minute project you can do it with a 10 minute project i mean you could either even take like a whole you know a podcast episode and yeah. actually render out the whole thing i'll tell you what i'm what, one thing i will do is i'm gonna i'm gonna do four kind of tests like that one with it on my external ssd that i do everything from mm. copying it to the hard drive internal hard drive itself running it as well and do that on both machines and just see whether the um the data rate between the external hard drive right. on the new one is actually a bottleneck. Right. Okay, speed. It's Essentially yeah. it might be. Yeah. I'm not sure what data rate they're going in at, but um the speed of the internal SSDs is even mm. faster on these new ones as well. Right. So it's I don't know. I might be regretting only getting one terabyte soon. No, oh, well. We'll see. Yeah. We'll yeah that'll, see. Be, that'll be interesting. Interesting thing to um yeah. To look at. Stay tuned. I will uh, update you in due course. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Cry your eyes out, you PC users. What are you saying? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are alienating? A- alienating? I can't even speak today. Mm. See, that's how exhausted I am still from, from last night's. That's it. Oh, sorry. Just just popped into my mind. Just sort of talking about Apple. Um, uh, I met a mate the other day who, uh, um, who I haven't seen since before. Well, eight couple of years now, I guess mm. it must be. And he's always had iPhones and whatnot. He's only gone and moved to Samsung. Oh, interesting. Who does that? Who moves that direction? So, Who ditches an iPhone to go to Android? I don't know, but I've just had the exact <laughs> opposite experience where like a former, not a former, a colleague of mine, um, or actually some, somebody I, I used to work with very closely, has um, and, and has basically flown the Android flag for years, mm-hmm. right? I think her, her husband is a he's a programmer or something like that. So you know, it's this. You know what I mean? That, so you'd be it, amazed how common that is. Yeah, it's like a family affair, like you know, to be anti Apple sort of thing. Um, and now she texted me yesterday or the, a few days ago. These Android users are uh, users are also the same people who run Linux. Oh yeah, yeah. But yeah. <laughs> well, that's good. Or still insist on using Windows. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I like programming in. C basic, yeah, like, you know, on a day off, <laughs> not, but yeah, anyway. So she she texted me uh, the other day saying, like, Ooh, I just ordered my first iPhone. And I'm like, Okay, well done, <laughs> well done. That's weird. I wonder welcome, what, welcome to the rest of the world. I wonder what brought about this, um, yeah. you know, change in attitude. But yeah. hey. I mean, ultimately, ultimately, I guess if you're happy with what you're using, then 
Oh, yeah, of you course. Know. Yeah, I'm, I'm only being uh, um, An facetious for the uh, <laughs> the sake of it. But uh, yeah, it doesn't make no, yeah. like, no, it makes no difference. I mean, if you already use a MacBook, for example, it kind of makes sense to have an iPhone because everything just... It's so seamless. Yeah, I mean, in all seriousness, you know, for us as a family, it's a it's an issue of our ecosystem. Yeah, because you know, this, yeah. like if you think about it as a, as a family, you know, um, once you're in, though, you'll never leave. It's a bit like Hotel yeah. California. Apple, no, it's isn't it? true. That is very true. But I mean, the same can be said for like Samsung, for instance, you know, with the TVs and phones and whatever else. But it's not too dissimilar because you know, as a family, like we have a, you know, we use Apple TV. Um, you know, we have MacBooks and 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 uh, iMacs and and uh, iPhones and whatnot. And so everything's integrated. So like if I want to airdrop a photo or some something to my daughter or she wants to airdrop something to me or a document, mm-hmm. you know, I need to, then, you know, we have like, um, you know, joint family calendars, for example. Yep. You know, we can all control um, the Apple TV with our phones as a remote build-in. So, you know, no more chasing for a remote that's again for the umpteenth time mm-hmm. under the couch or the dog's taking it somewhere or whatever. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it just makes life so much easier. You know, shared notes, for example, like how yeah. many times do we, we share do notes? Constantly. Yeah. My wife and I, for instance, we share notes, like shopping lists. Very simple, you know? Yep. Like I'm on a way to, let's say, you know, we, we have a shopping list, you know, I'm being sent out to get the groceries sort of a thing. You know, by the time I get to the supermarket, um, there might be a few more items on that list because my wife just remembered. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I mean, this is Absolutely. like this is practical stuff. Yeah. Um. And so, you know, I mean, there's an unlimited number of uses yeah. that only works because we're all in the same ecosystem. So, you know, and so from that, uh, from that point of view, it makes perfect sense. Now, we also have an Alexa, for example, which I quite like the idea that you can just talk to the thing. <laughs> you know, we've renamed it. See, I don't like this. Oh, uh, but you like, you like this because this is, this is like, this is my wife. Oh, oh my God, actually in brackets before I tell you the Alexa story. Um, <clears throat> so we went Christmas shopping the other day. And you know, my wife's a massive Star Trek fan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's a massive, massive Trek. Although she also loves Star Wars. She likes spaceships, basically. Best woman I've ever married. <laughs> um, but we, we uh, walked past this toy store and Playmobil, remember Playmobil? Yeah. Yeah. Playmobil have brought out the USS Enterprise in a, on a massive scale with all the characters as Playmobil characters, oh, right. that, the original series, you know, Kirk, Spock, the rest yeah. of it, Uhura. Um, and, and they have like different levels and the bridge it looks great. You can take the lid off and then there's the whole bridge with everything in it. It's great. And they have these little furry things. What were they called? Feebles or something or whatever. Oh no, they were, uh, oh, tri- tribbles? Tribbles, that's tribbles. it. Yeah, so there's even some Playmobil tribbles in there. Excellent. Wake it. Excellent. Oh, totally so you bought awesome. it for yourself? Well, I was debating, but then, you know, then I walked past the Lego store and, you know, it can't be that. <laughs> so. Have you got your Millennium Falcon yet? <laughs> for 800 pounds or whatever. Uh, they now do yeah. the at at, which is amazing. Um, they also have the Ecto one. Very cool. Mm-hmm. Ghostbusters mobile. Uh, but they also have the film sets of Friends. Okay. And Seinfeld. Oh, in Lego. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. So, you know. Surprised it went with Seinfeld. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I went, uh, I wanted to, I think, I think I watched some of the early seasons of Seinfeld on Netflix or something recently, mm-hmm. just, just for fun. Yeah, it's just popped on, I think. We yeah. just got it. Yeah. So it's quite interesting. Mm. Uh, anyway, back to the Alexa. Insert bass line now. <laughs> yeah. So the thing about Alexa is, is I, I personally think it's pretty lame to constantly say Alexa. It's a bit like, hey Siri. I mean, yeah, it's, it's just it's, it's, it's awful totally lame right i have all that turned off i just i have to hold a button on my iphone well, to use that. so um my wife renamed the alexa to computer so now you walk into the kitchen and you go computer <laughs> set timer yeah <laughs> nice <laughs> wicked love it do you now walk around the house with a, a, a bald cap on and yes yeah absolutely call yourself a jean-luc <laughs> computer engage engage yeah so, you know, but what's, what's annoying, what's annoying about this is, is that the Alexa store computer doesn't integrate with the rest mm. of the ecosystem. Get rid of it. So, you know, it would make more sense if it did. So, you know, anyway, there's, you know, that's that. Do Apple do one yet? Yeah, Apple do, um, Apple do their, like, um, 
speaker thingy thing, mm. active, whatever it's called. I can't remember. Yeah. Apple Pod or something. Get that? Um, I should have done it in the beginning, but for some reason, I don't know. I think my daughter talked my wife into into the Alexa and I just mm. bought her like a big one, something. Break it. Oh, yeah. Well, I just you know, dropped on the kitchen for a yeah, Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Anyway, what else are we talking to, uh, talking about today? A very quick uh, sort of thing. If you're, because your story about, um, you know, the delivery times of your MacBook being extraordinarily long, that just reminded me. Um, I read a thing, you know, um, Nikon are starting to ship the Z9. Mm. But mm. if you've ordered one, you might have to wait for it for a bit because. A year? Yeah, I mean, there are. Like, really? Yeah, I mean, well, the delivery, wow. you know, bottlenecks or whatever. Um, What's causing. So here's the it thing. just can't keep up with demand or well, there's actually is, a shortage? Yeah. So there's one thing we talked about this a few episodes ago. Um, they definitely can't keep up with demand because the demand was just insane. Yeah. Um, but also there's, you know, the shortage of, of um, chips and whatever else. Mm. Um, and of mm. course, I mean, Ken and I are experiencing the same thing with the R3, by the way. Yeah. yeah. So exactly the same thing there. Um, yeah. So that's, you know, so something. There's also, you know, the new, uh, the Nick collection has come up with a new Updates, Nick 4.3, I think. Now, so if you are a Nick collection user, have you ever used Nick? No. You should, because it's, you know, I mean. Named after me. There you go. There you go. Um, so N- the Nick collection Do is. Do I get a percentage of that? I don't know. <laughs> we should. Um, it literally, literally nicked your name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. Two puns, two puns, one episode. I know. All right. End now. Well, um. <laughs> So yeah, uh, the new collection basically is, is a collection of plugins uh, that work for Photoshop, Lightroom, and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, they're very good. They're really very good. Um, they used to be owned by Google some time ago, and they were free. Then Google sold them to a company called DxO um, some years ago, and now they're not free anymore, which what, is highly annoying. What sort of um, uh, plugins do they do? What? Uh, they do a range of different plugins. Um, you know, uh, there's an excellent black and white converter. Mm-hmm. That's really, really oh, good. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 of course. Silver effects or whatever it's called. Yeah. And um, there's like, uh, there's a, it's basically based on presets, mm-hmm. but you can modify, you can come up with your own presets and you can modify the presets really to your house content. So there's a whole bunch of different ones, like color effects that have all sorts of different, um, you know, coloring options and whatever, mm-hmm. filters. Um, they're really very, very good. And, um, and very often actually just add that little bit of final gloss to an image. Mm, nice. Um, yeah, it's really cool. And it integrates really well into Lightroom and Photoshop. Mm-hmm. Um, so they work really well. There's also like um, things like there's a sharpener, for instance, you know, image sharpening, um, stuff like that. So all in, very useful. Sounds like a company that, sh- if they aren't already, should be doing a, a mobile app version for consum- regular you know, consumers, you know. Very true. I have absolutely zero idea whether that yeah. exists or not. For people but, who just take snaps on their phone yeah. and... Upload into Instagram and whatnot. <clears throat> yeah, it's very like a great little the technology, suite of tools. Yeah, the technology behind it is really quite good. Um, you know, the way that you can modify some of the filters mm. um, is, is really quite cool. So it works. It's not too dissimilar from Lightroom's brushes, actually, the mm-hmm. way you apply some of the you know, regional filter sort of thing. Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, again, I've used them, I've probably used them for about five, six years or something like that. And then I didn't use them for a little while. Um, and then I... So, uh, you know, bought the latest collection mm-hmm. and really liked them, especially for the black and white conversion. I really love them, actually. Mm. That um, black and white converter is very, very, very good. Mm. And of course, because you can come up with your own presets within that software, you can literally apply that to, you know, to X amount of your of your images really quite quickly. Do they, do they... Sp- your, those kind of user presets, if you like, will if you create one in Lightroom, will that transfer to Photoshop automatically? Basically, what happens is as you um, as you edit that, as you launch that plugin, you literally edit that photo in the DxO software, like in the collection I software, see. Yep. where you have all the different options or whatever. And then yep. as you save that, it'll save automatically back into Lightroom. Yeah, yeah. Um, or okay. Photoshop, for example. So gotcha, know. gotcha, gotcha. Um, so you know, it's and it applies it, I think in Photoshop it applies it like a layer almost, so you can turn mm-hmm. it on and off, you know. Um, but it's, yeah. It's so it like, sounds like it works in a similar way to, um, so for a, before I moved to DaVinci, um, 
uh, I used a plugin called Cinema Grade. Oh yeah, okay. Um, and that takes you to an external, yeah, kind of you know, their app if you like, yeah. and you do it there, and it saves it automatically within mm. um, within Premiere or DaVinci or whatever you're yeah. using. But DaVinci has so much of that stuff already built in. Built in. Oh, it's right, just okay. less need for it, so I don't use it anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah, just, I mean, th there was a point where um, I stopped using any collection just mainly because I did all of that either in Lightroom or, mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, you, you can, I mean, typically have a whole bank of different um, presets in Lightroom, for example, you know, and, and they have a lot of black and white conversion mm -hmm. type plugins as well. Yeah. It's just that actually on balance, I find the black and white converter in the collection actually better and quicker and more flexible you know um so yeah i really quite like it mm. it definitely gets me to where, where i want to first of all it gets me to where i want to go much quicker and secondly i just have a lot of a lot more options like you can change the film stock and you know blah yep. blah and, you know change a whole bunch of different um aspects of it um and not only does it make life quicker, but it also gives you a lot of ideas. Mm. And I quite like yeah. that, you know. You look at different ways of converting, different presets, and you kind of go, oh, I like this aspect of that. I like another aspect of something else. And then you sort of, in your head, I think you get you get to where you want to go quicker creatively. Mm -hmm. you know? that's, yeah. that's kind of what I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then, of course, you know, once you come across something that you think looks really, really good, you just say, as a use a preset and, yeah. you know, it's available to you again next time next time round. Oh, that's cool and if it puts it as a layer in photoshop i guess depend it really obviously massively depends what else you're doing in there yeah. that you, i guess you can you can then move that layer around and it'll have a slightly different different effects well i mean you can the obviously overall you, image you, i guess did you turn it on and off so whether mm. you know and of course you can blend it as well as the other thing mm. so um, especially i mean this is the thing so especially with a black and white layer um i quite like doing that sometimes um it gives you the um opportunity to desaturate your colors a little bit by adding a black and light, a white layer and then then um, running the opacity down on a mm -hmm. to 50 percent or whatever maybe um until you get the right amount of, sort of color desaturation yeah and it, it just it really it's, adds a little bit of punch to it as well yeah and that's a slightly different desaturated look than it had you just desaturated yeah the, absolutely the yeah it's, it's just yeah. a different look yeah um that i quite like it it's quite cool it's, sort of, it's almost like a Feels like a very seventies sort of yeah. technique. Um, yeah, I guess you can cool. brush that in then as well to, or brush out Ooh, to create a color yeah. pop. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> I have to see any of those oh, images I again. Do I do enjoy your hatred of uh, of that. <laughs> Those were the days back in the nineties. But no, stuff like that can be really interesting, and and particularly moving stuff around. I, I, with video editing in particular, you know, it, you know, it makes a huge. If you're filming in log and you do your conversion, right, it makes a huge difference where you put that conversion. Sure. Yeah. So you can you yeah. can grade into your conversion, which is what I do, mm. or you can grade after it. It will just feel slightly different and look slightly different. Mm. Um, where you put if you're adding film grain, do you put that into the conversion or out of it? Yeah. The answer really should be put it into it because right. That's where film grain would have been. Yeah. Um, and it's just little things like that. And it, it just looks very different. To me, it looks more natural to put grain yeah. before your conversion than it does after. It just looks more natural. Yeah. That's just me. That's my personal taste. But. See, this is what I like about uh, the Nick Collection in, in many ways. One of, the, just one of the things I like about it is the fact that there are so many different um, kind of film stock simulators in there. Mm. You can simulate different types of film stock. And with that come different types of grains mm -hmm. so grain isn't just grain you actually have the flexibility to try lots of different yeah, types totally. of grains and you know um and you know where i find this really useful actually is, i bet you found one that you really like and you use all the time far uh, more than anything else yes i have one i have a particular film yeah. grain that i like that i just yeah. use all the time <laughs> i mean you know the thing about grain is um you know we typically try and you know, shoot things as clean as possible nowadays. But yeah. uh, the thing about grain is, is really that it kind of ties things together. It's interesting. So, so what I do with video mm. is, I'll not always, but I'll often run noise reduction. 
Yeah, because unfortunately, that's the nature of the beast with video and you, you, <laughs> constant light. Just mm. there's never, you know, well, there's always enough, but um, a lot you'll often shoot underexposed a little bit. The if you're particularly if you mm. don't have complete control over the situation, mm. it's, you're going to end up slightly underexposed. Um, or if you're getting there nice and exposed, your noise goes up because it's too much yeah. ISO. Anyway, so when you've done that and you're running a bit of noise reduction, you will lose just a little bit of sharpness mm. as well. True, yeah. Rather than just going for sharpening afterwards, adding the grain in gives you back some of what you lost through the noise reduction. Mm. Not all of it, but some of it, because mm. it's just the way grain looks on yeah. top of that image. And then if you then add a little bit of sharpening at all, you've then got a fantastic looking image. All right, cool. It works outstandingly well. Maybe I should try that on my boxing images because I could run some severe noise reduction on some of those. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know. But, and, you know, it, who was I talking to recently about this? I can't remember. I was talking, I was just having a, a similar kind of conversation uh, a few weeks ago about grain and noise. Mm. And yeah. they were saying that if you've got noise, why would you denoise it and then add grain? So they look completely different. Different thing. Yeah. It's a totally different I mean, thing. Especially digital noise. When it's, oh, it's a completely different thing. It's awful. And yeah, if you glance at it, okay, you could mistake it for noise rather than grain. But no, they but, look very different. Yeah, I mean, especially when you're in extreme situations. Like again, you know, coming back to these boxing images, you know, especially the ones where you had like the lower half underexposed, for example, or like virtually almost completely black. Mm. You know, of course, you know, you go in and you kind of go, okay, so what if I run a filter on that? Or what, what if I just just to see how much information there actually is, you know, I just crank the exposure up, for example, or crank the shadows up. And the amount of digital noise that is that comes out and it's really super ugly. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I saw 8,000 or whatever I was, you know, shooting this with. It, it was horrible, mm. you know. And again, I mean, the sensor is so good that when you look at it straight out of camera, it actually looks really, given that it's ISO 8,000, it actually does look, still yeah. really quite good, you know, but you really, you'll see the, the pitfalls of that when you start to, work, you know, work with the exposure. And and basically what it means is, you know, with these images, the ones that are either, you know, completely black or like half the top of the bottom half missing, um, there's no coming back from that. Mm. No matter what you do, there's zero coming back from that. Because that noise is like ugly, multicolored, digital disgustingness <laughs> you know it really is horrible um this you know with the bin all these images oh man yeah fun times but there's another thing i was reading about actually um this week and this is like your mistakes uh, like mistakes that are common to all photographers mm -hmm. there's not like i read um there are three mistakes that are common to all photographers or something and um i like reading these kind of articles yeah because you can sort of identify with some, with some of those, or maybe with all of those, you know? Um, Absolutely. So I thought that would be, be an interesting thing to discuss a little bit. Yeah. So, you know, mistake number one was, you're trying to be like other photographers. Brilliant. Yeah. So, see, there's an argument to say that actually that's a good way to learn. Yep. And I do think that's a good way to learn. It teaches you techniques. It teaches you... You have to diagnose, not diagnose, sorry, uh, sort of kind of reverse engineer the picture mm -hmm. and work out what they've done, read up about it, watch some videos on it probably. As, uh, someone will tell you somewhere how to how they did it. Yeah. It's a good, good way to learn, but use it as a learning tool rather than all your images just totally recreating someone else. Yeah. I, th I think by recreating... Um you know, things, I mean, it, music is a really good example. I think we don't talk about this right? before. It's, you know, it's, you can really only find your own voice yeah. by, you know, imitating X amount of other musicians, yeah. you know, guitarists, for example. And, you know, as a result of it all, eventually yeah. your own voice will become obvious, you know, yeah. but it's, it's basically, a, you know, a combination of all of your influences. Yeah. And I think, you know, photographically or creatively generally, there's a good argument um, for that to be the case. So, you know, when you look at, because we all like different things and we all, we all have preferences and things that we don't like, whatever. And, you know, we all like certain colors. You know, we like 
the way that certain photographers pose the subjects, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but other people might actually totally dislike that. And they might have preference for, you know, for maybe more naturally posed subjects or whatever it may be, right? You can, you can look at, uh, you know, Annie Leibovitz is a good example it's, you know, uh, in this article. She's been talked about as well. But Annie Leibovitz is a really good example because her, you know, her portraiture, uh, her portraiture sort of a thing is interesting because especially with group portraits. And this is like, I think, where I really like her stuff is when it comes to group portraits. Mm -hmm. um, because I really like, I personally really like the way that she poses multiple subjects in a scene, mm -hmm. you know, and... These are not natural poses. And this is where opinion can differ. Some people might say, well, but that looks completely unnatural. True. That's, it does. That's part of the style, really. You know, you either dig that or you don't. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, which is totally cool. I mean, you know, each to their own. For me personally, I quite like that sort of look. It's almost hyper real. Because everything about the image is hyper real. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the lighting is hyper real. The... Uh, the posing is hyper real. You know, the post production is hyper real. Uh, none, of, none of this is supposed to look real, and I happen to like a little heightened reality, as it were. You know, so yeah. artistically, that's just um, you know how I'm how I'm pulled. Other people are not, um, and again, totally cool. But what I'm saying is, you know, you look at these, at that sort of imagery, or at these artists or photographers, and you kind of think, okay, well, I want to try that. I want to see how that works. And that gets you into dealing with people, moving them around, mm -hmm. trying out different things. It gets you into the whole community. How do I communicate with my model, for example? You know, how do I make, you know, how do I get them to do what I, what I want them to do? Um, and that's a really important learning curve. So actually yeah. getting down yeah. with it and trying stuff out just for the sake of it is super useful because you learn a ton. You know, and in the process, you will find yourself. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Totally agree. So, you know, I, I do think, I mean, this is where I agree with that sentiment, you know, um, you know, trying to be like, like other photographers. There are, you know, there are certain uh, pitfalls. I think, you know, we, we talked last, uh, I think last week we talked about um, headshots. And so, you know, when you look at the type of headshot that was originally sort of pioneered by Peter Hurley, for example, you know, that white mm -hmm. background, um, it's almost like cropped in, um, you know, top of the head missing type of look, um, which on one hand is very natural because he, mm -hmm. he gets very natural um, expressions, which looks great. But at the same time, of course, it's also totally artificial because when do you ever stand in front of a completely white wall? <laughs> you know, <laughs> so... Um, and, you know, studio lit in a particular way. And, you know, it's just a really nice, punchy look. You know, you see that a lot in terms of, like, you see a lot of people imitating that look. Yeah. You know. Um, and it's, I always find it really refreshing when I come across a headshot photographer that does something completely different. And this is kind of where Ivan Weiss comes in. Mm. You know, we we mm. spoke to him, um, you know, a few months ago. Uh, you look at his stuff and it's like, yeah, that is... Completely different. Yeah. You know, technically totally different, creatively completely different, you know, and and probably as far as the purpose is concerned, also very different. But that's really cool. You have these almost like, I would say, opposing styles in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and, and you can, by trying to recreate one or the other. And in fact, we have an episode where he talks us through the whole edit. Yeah, of one of his images, which is great, you know, That's to get cracking. It's just full of information. Though. Yeah, exactly. So Love that. that's really interesting, you know. And to try that out um, and to just get a feel for it will just give you another yeah. um, weapon in your arsenal, yeah. you know. So, that's so that's the thing. But if you're trying to be like somebody else forevermore, then th that isn't going to give you a, like an individual. No edge no. at all you know no. in other words if ivan had tried to create images like peter hurley then he would have never been able to actually carve out this little niche for himself yeah. in a way where you look at an image and you go wait that looks like an ivan image yeah it happens and, to me all I, the time and and that you know 
And you absolutely can say that about his work as well, can't yeah. you? But it's even when you see, you know, yeah. other people creating. Actually, today I came across um, an image that there could have been an Ivan image, I think. You know, it was really that kind of style. It wasn't. But it was like, okay, right. Okay, here's somebody obviously leaning you know, yeah. into that style yeah, sort yeah. of thing. That's, yeah, I find that quite, that's really quite interesting. Oh, well, Ivan's yeah. style is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, check out the episode. I'll put the link up there. Or and he has the most amazing beard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> absolutely. Um, so the other thing was, uh, you know, confusing gear with artistry. That was the other... What do you mean by that? ...mistake common to, uh, common to photographers. Uh, confusing gear with artistry. So that's, I think that's kind of like, you know, when you sort of think, well, in order to achieve this, I need to buy X gear. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, it's that. That age old question. Yeah. Bit of gas syndrome. Oh, completely. Mm. Uh, yeah. It's no it, it it's knowing where you are you you how do I explain this? You got to know where that line is, I guess. So yeah. where can you absolutely not achieve what you want to achieve because of equipment? Yeah, you know, I fell into that trap a long time ago, I remember. Um, I fell into that trap when I was first kind of getting into softboxes, or octoboxes, actually. Mm -hmm. And so um, I I have, I think I own three octoboxes that are very similar in size. Like one's like 85 centimeters across, one's like, I would say, 100. Mm -hmm. And the other was like something like 110 or 120. Well, anyway, they're very close in size. For some reason, I thought I need to get like considerably smaller from the 110, but it makes very little difference. In the I mean, they're basically, <laughs> for all intents and purposes, they're pretty much identical. Mm, you know, yeah. that was uh, that was definitely you know money thrown out the window. I mean, I should have just stuck with with one size, and I'd be it would have been it. Yeah. But as it happens, there are three of those that are pretty much the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> You know. I'm sure you'll find a situation where one just doesn't quite fit in a location and you just, you uh, just like the smaller one. I, I mostly, I use the smallest one out of the lot um, all Easier the time. Easier to put up. Yeah, that's <laughs> Easier it. Easier to keep stable. We use it, in fact, when, you know, when, you use, when we use the boom arm, yep. and we light something on location, we use that one. Yep. Because it's just a little bit lighter than Absolutely. the bigger one. Yeah. You know, so, you know, that's it. But that does happen. I mean, you know, the other thing is, Again, I think we mentioned this as if remotely uh, in a different context last week or something. It's this thing where you kind of think you always have to have the latest piece of glass or the latest camera mm, or something. Yeah. Um, you know, in order, to, in order to achieve whatever it is that you're trying to achieve. But but really, these sort of improvements in those are so much at the extreme end. Yeah, that's right. You know, like you should be able to take a sharp image with a 24 to 70 lens that's 10 years old. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. At ideal lighting conditions. Like say with something studio lit, for example, you know, or in regular daylight conditions, just the same as you should be able to do that with a lens that's only like a year old. Do you yeah. know what I mean? I mean, Absolutely. there's no, the, the, the benchmark, like the bottom, you know, the bar for, for that is, is literally, that is it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, and whether, you know, when you're in an extreme situation, then yes, maybe one lens might outperform another, but you really have to be at the extreme end yeah, of that. Yeah, that's right. You know. Yeah. And that's, that's the same without grading your camera body, isn't it? Yeah. It's either got to go wrong. Yeah. And unfixable, or there needs to be a marked increase in convenience. Or, of course, your shooting habits change to the point where yeah. you need features now, you know. That, yeah, we that talked about this recently. This, yeah. You know, it's, it made total sense for me to to upgrade and switch. Oh, for you, yeah. So I, sure. I was working on two different brands. Yeah. Now I'm using one brand with the same same amount. Yeah, absolutely. I can now, I've now got um, autofocus on 120. And I've got eye dissection, which was, they've just, okay, that's just made my life easier. Yeah. But not having also focus at 120, that was a problem. See, the thing is, like, if I shot more sports, mm -hmm. um, especially boxing matches and stuff like that, or boxing fights, whatever they're called. I don't even know what they're called. 
<laughs> I guess they're fights. I mean, wherever. <laughs> but anyway, so um, you know, if I did that oh, more regularly, then I could really see a very, very good argument for eye focus, you mm -hmm. know, um, and stuff like that. You know, in fact, I mean, yesterday, I literally thought I'm going to have to bid my camera body because I literally, at first I thought like, yeah. you know, the, the shutter assembly is done. I'm, I'm pretty sure your, your camera only has like two eye focus points on the screen anyway, right? On the center. Yeah, two big ones. Four, maybe. <laughs> I suppose that. Considering one of them. But, um, yeah, I mean, generally I can't really complain, you know, the autofocus system on that is actually, it's okay, you know, it's good. Yeah. Um, for most things. Um, the eye focus thing, but in that situation is when, because that is one thing I am doing is I'm physically moving that box around a lot and I'm, I'm, I'm having to do it fast because if you're, for instance, if you want to get that over the shoulder shot where you get, you know, close up of somebody's face over the shoulder of the other boxer, mm -hmm. you know, you don't have a lot of time. It's a split seconds because they're moving all the time. Mm. So it's over that shoulder, then it's over that shoulder and, you know, they change and they rotate. So you really, you know, I have to move extremely fast. Mm. And if you had a, you know, if the system did that for you, it would take a whole bunch of stress Absolutely. out of, of taking these shots. And I think, you know, your keeper rate would be much higher. Absolutely. So that's, you know, that's really from, purely from a practical point of view. And what that would mean is, you know, if for instance, let's say, just to keep the math simple, let's, let's say you take a thousand shots, you know, and let's say for argument's sake, 850 of that are keepers, that's a much higher ratio mm -hmm. um, than, you know, if it was only like 250. Yeah, absolutely. Or whatever. So, and then of course that means, it, you know, in retrospect, then in the future you wouldn't have to take as many shots and then you would save hard drive space. And also your editing, you know, it would, it would just save you time afterwards. Yeah. So this is where it actually ends up paying for itself. Mm -hmm. You know, because there's a different difference between spending four hours editing something like that or spending two hours. Yeah. There's a huge difference absolutely. in that. That's where you can kind of see well, you know, the money comes back in basically. Mm. Um, so again, you know, if if I did this on a regular basis or something, then yes, there would be absolutely an argument, mm. you know, for, um, for upgrading. As it is, I'm not doing it on a regular basis, and so as a consequence, there isn't. But again, I was yesterday, last night, I was close to. Well, you need to think ahead because if you want to get that that Z9, you better order now if you want it in the next <laughs> two or three years. Well, yeah. Does that mean? <laughs> do you think if you a year to save up for it too, though? Yeah, I guess it would. Yeah, or do you have to? Pay, you don't have to pay up front, do you? How does this work? Depends. Sure. I guess it depends on company's company or right. whoever you order from. Um, you, hmm, I don't know. Try it out. <laughs> My wife wouldn't thank me. I tell you. <laughs> anyway, so here's the the last point is like uh, you know, don't compare yourself to someone else's success. What oh, I agree mean? with that. I would totally agree with that. What does that mean? Just because someone is super successful at what they do doesn't mean that you aren't you know their success is just they're that extra one that one person in a million who just got super successful mm. or and you're you know you're just not that that person it doesn't mean that you're no good because it oh, can yeah. feel that way when you see why are they so successful why are they able to do this why are they able to do that they are doing that it doesn't mean that you're bad. It's not what it means at all. The other point to kind of add to the side of that is just because they appear to be super successful doesn't actually mean that they are. No, that's very true. They could be in, just for argument's sake, they could be in all sorts of debt. They could appear to be busy 60 hours a week shooting. Mm. Doesn't mean they're paying the bills necessarily. No, for sure. And you, um, might, you might be shooting 20 hours a week. Yeah. You're paying the bills. And of course, that's basically down to how you define success. Yeah. You know, whether you define it in monetary terms, you know, um, or whether you define it in reputation or, mm -hmm. you know, busyness in terms of time spent doing something. I don't agree with you the know. business one, but. Yeah, I mean, it depends, you know. Uh, again, so I think the different, in my head, there's sort of different categories of, mm -hmm. of success. You know, it's a, like, we've spoken to, you know, wedding photographers, for example, who are very successful at what they do, as in like, you know, their practice is busy, they're shooting a lot of weddings, you know, they're getting a lot of work in, um, and so on and so forth. And that's, in a sense, that is successful. If you can, you know, if you can feed your family through photography full-time, that in itself is a success. You know? Yeah. It's, 
I, I guess where I, not that I disagree. Um, so I, I don't always buy into the, just because you're busy makes you successful. Sure. Because I, I, I don't think that's true. Um, it can be a good indication that you're successful, you're being successful because you keep mm. getting booked. Um, are those clients rebooking you? Maybe, maybe not. Is the quality of work that you're actually putting out any good? That's subjective. I appreciate yeah. that. But there's you know, some givens in it. Just because you're busy doesn't, I don't think, necessarily mean you, you just might be too cheap. <laughs> well, no, that's, that is, you know? that's oh, also true. Was, there's a thousand little things that could go into it. You know, the thing is, I think it's, it, again, it comes down to how you how you measure success. Mm. Because, you know, for instance, you could, you could consider yourself successful if, you know, you make enough money from photography so that you can basically pay off your gear. Let's say, you know, you make enough mm -hmm. money so that, you know, your hobby is of self-financing. And once you've achieved that, well, that's a success. That's a great success, actually, yeah. you know, in comparison to, to lots of, lots of yeah. people. Um, you could say, like, right, you know, I want to, you know, my goal is that, that I can basically feed my family from mm -hmm. photography alone. Once you achieve that, that's fantastic, a fantastic success. But, of course, success doesn't necessarily have to be monetary in nature. Yeah. You know, it could be that you're working on, you know, a body of work, like a project or whatever it may be. And then the completion of that, you know, is a success. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, some of the personal projects we've, we've spoken to, um, you know, some of our guests about in the past, um, you know, um, I think, you know, or you create something that maybe means something for somebody else. That could be, that mm -hmm. could be a great success. So it really just depends on, you know, how you, how you define success for yourself. And so comparing yourself to somebody else's success, it, you know, that's really in the eye of the beholder, I think. Yeah. 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 yeah I mean, I think that's something, it's something you learn over time that I think it's natural to basically compare yourself to other people. Um, there's, there's nothing you know, wrong with that. Actually, yeah. I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing. No, but it, it, it can be a bad thing if you start moving into the, like you define your, your self by someone else's oh, standards. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, um, sure. that, that's when it can become quite dangerous. And that's part of the reason or one reason why I think a lot of people give up on, you know, whether it's photography, videography, whether it's playing the guitar. <laughs> yeah. Playing the guitar is a really good example. Do you know what I mean? That's because yeah. they just feel that they're no, that's, that's where the, that self-worth comes in. Not self-worth. Yeah. Um, yeah, that perception of yourself as being, oh, I'm not good enough. Yeah. Just because this person over here is outstanding. Well, and, you know, I think that the thing with, you know, guitar playing is actually a really good example because very, very early on when I was a teenager or something, I actually really understood that there was always going to be someone who was going to be a better guitarist yeah. than me. Always. Do you know, funny, thank you. So, I, and for a long time now, I've, I've always thought to myself, um, obviously, it's not the situation right now in this particular room, mm. but you always, you never want to be the smartest person in the room. For sure. Because you're not going to learn anything. No, true. And they always say, I mean, they always say, you know, when in, in music. It's not true here, obviously, but. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but, you know, in music, um, you know, it's the same thing. Like, for instance, you want to, you want to surround yourself with people who are better than yourself because that's how, yeah. that's how you, you know, push yourself to get better. How do you get and better? That's absolutely true. Like in a band situation, for example. Um, you know, you want to be playing with people who are slightly above your own level. Yeah. And, you know, it will make you a better player. You know? Um, and that's, you know, that's, I think photography is not too, not too dissimilar to that. It's, you, I mean, in my mind, it's always, you get to ultimately sort of look at your work, you know, and, um, and look at it with some distance, you know, because immediately after you've just shot something, you either thrill, thrill and you think like, this is the best thing since sliced bread, or you think, oh man, it's complete not the rubbish. When you look at the same thing again a year later, or six months later, or a year later or something, mm. you look at it with fresh eyes and you kind of go, oh, actually that wasn't too bad. Or you think, eh, that wasn't quite as good as I thought. Yeah. You know, you get, you regain that objectivity. Absolutely. You know, over, over time. And it'll give you a much better um, position to judge from. Absolutely. Because you've, you know. you've got more hours under your belt doing whatever sure. it is that you're doing. You know, yeah. they, they, you talk, people talk about this all the time with um, being a recording engineer, mixing and whatnot. Mm. 
it, you know, and it's just the same, just true for everything, but it gets talked about in that world a lot because so many people are learning and want to record themselves is that 10,000 hour kind oh, yeah. of rule. Yeah. You know, you're, you're only, uh, you know, a master at something, if you like, you know, competent, so to speak, like really competent. Mm-hmm. Um, once you've hit 10,000 hours of doing something. Where does that 10,000 hour thing actually come from? I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure. Someone... I don't know if someone actually sat down and worked it out and did research into it, or they've just plucked a number out of the air. I, I think I don't that's know. probably what it is, but yeah. you know, but it's a good. But that, it's the idea it's the behind idea. it, you yeah. know. You know, and if you've been learning doing something for a year, your work will be X quality. Sure, yeah, it could be amazing, by the way, easily be amazing. But in a year's further year down the line, mm. you've doubled the amount of time and experience you've had doing that particular sure. task, if you like. Yeah. You are going to be better. Actually, I tell you, I give you a really good example for that because in the car on the way here, um, I've been, I've been, I've been singing along. I, I discovered a song that I, ha- I didn't actually know uh, existed. Okay, so in other words, I discovered a song that I hadn't heard before. Well, there we go. Put <laughs> <laughs> it easier words, um, and I really like it because it's kind of quirky. It's a track called uh, "Rocky Raccoon" uh, from the Beatles' White Album. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you never heard no, that? No, I've never heard it before. Really? No, it's like, well, you know, I listened to it. Actually, I listened to it with um, earlier this afternoon with my daughter. She was like playing. She's she's in the she's into the Beatles at the moment because, funny enough, just as this documentary's come out, and um, they've also been talking about the '60s in school, right? Oh, right. In a in, yeah. a in a class, and so they were listening to some some Beatles songs as examples of '60s music, and so she, you know, when I was watching this documentary, she was quite curious, you know. Um, and wanted to know about the Beatles and blah, blah. And so, mm. so she's been, um, because she obviously runs the Spotify playlist when we're in the car. Obviously. Um, and so she's temporarily, oh, that's funny. Because normally she listens to the Foo Fighters. Like she's a big Foo Fighters mm-hmm. fan. She's 10. Um, and so today she listened to Helter Skelter by the Beatles. And the, she listened to the intro and she goes like, that sounds exactly like a Foo Fighters <laughs> intro. Brilliant. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, cool. Love that. Um, but yeah, so she came across the song and we listened to it like I thought that was hilarious. So anyway, so on the way here, I was singing, I was trying to learn the lyrics and sing along, right? And it was atrocious at first. Mm-hmm. It was marginally better when I got here. But um it, I mean there was there really was a marked improvement. And I probably I probably sang through it, I don't know, maybe 30 times on the way here, something like that. It's a very short song. And um and I was really getting it by the end of it. And it's, you know, mm-hmm. it literally just goes to show it's, it's just basically, you know, learn, play, repeat <laughs> all the, you know, all the way over. Yep. And it's, uh, you know, and eventually you'll just, you know, you get there. And it's, I think that is true for all creative yeah. subjects, you know. Exactly. Exactly. It's why, you know, tell students who are learning, learning guitar that if you play a little bit every single day, if you That's can't okay. play that that tune today, play it every yeah. single day, just a little bit of it. In a month's time, you'll be able to play, yeah. play it or play half of it or whatever it might be. Yeah, I, um, I remember learning. This is like years ago when I was, was much so much younger than today. Um, <laughs> anyway, so I was learning the solo to "Are You Gonna Go My Way," Lenny Kravitz, mm-hmm. right? And I remember listening to it at the time thinking i'm never going to be able to play that hmm. you know not in a million years first of all it's it's not complex well it's kind of a complex solo in the sense that there are quite a lot of phrases in there so there's a lot to remember and learn um but there's also there's some fast bits in there and i remember i remember at the time like this is just not like i can't won't be able to do it and i remember then working on it bit by bit by bit by bit by bit and i used to come back to it every day I used to work on it, even if it was half an hour or something, every every day, until eventually, 10 days down the line or whatever, I could play the whole thing perfectly. I remember it's like 70% of the speed or something. Mm-hmm. And then I would speed it up until I got to the point where I could play it exactly. at full speed. You know? Exactly. And now I can play this blindfolded with my hands yep. tied to my back with my big toe. Do you know what I mean? It's it's just, it just feels I did, so easy to play. Down. I did the same thing with um, Cliff Burton's bass solo on Kill 'Em All. 
Oh, right, okay. All right. The whole first half before the drums come in, that's actually pretty straightforward. Mm. It's not a big deal. But the section after that is actually really quite difficult to play some of that. Right. Um, and I couldn't play it when I was younger at all. Yeah. I can't play it now. <laughs> but I couldn't. But I, I practiced bar by bar, a couple of bars together, four bars together, yeah. slower speed, yeah, all of exactly. that, all of that kind of stuff until I could play the whole, the whole thing all the way through. Yeah. Um, and I did almost, I didn't quite get there because it's, it was, was tricky, but then I haven't played it for like 15 years or more. Yeah. I couldn't play that right now. Cause it's not my style. If I played that style every day, it'd be sure. fine. No problems, but it's not my style. I don't play that. Hmm. Um, yeah. So uh, just, you just get, just practice. Yeah. Simple as that. That's it. Practice. Nick. And you will get out of practice. You will get rusty. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. But what's funny is, you know, once you get back into it, it comes back really quickly. Yeah, it does. Yeah. You know, that's the thing. That's what I find. Um, it's a bit like driving a car or riding a bicycle. Yeah. Actually, you know, uh, even if you haven't ridden a bicycle for some time, it'll come back yeah. pretty, pretty that's quickly. It. So, I mean, again, you know, photography is no different. You know, if you, you know, if you take your camera out and you practice, you know, and you shoot a lot, you will get better. I mean, it's not. That's it. You know, totally. There's no. There's no um, you know, it just can't happen any so, other way. So anyway, so the, you know, don't compare yourself to someone else as a success. I think, yeah, just don't do that. Is it, man? That's no, it's not necessary, really. And on that bombshell. Terrible disappointment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is, is that the time already? Well, it is. It well, is. we have come to the end of Camera Take Podcast episode 86. We're not too far away from Christmas. You can tell by the jumper. <laughs> yes, you can tell. But yeah, um, you know, if you are listening to the audio version of this podcast, be reminded that you can um, not only listen to our sultry voices, but see our beautiful faces over on YouTube. Just head over to youtube.com forward slash camera shake or, or not or, but and uh, check us out on our website, camera shake podcast.com. Um, sign up to our community. It'd be super awesome because we have in the very near future, got a little gem coming your way. Mm. And if you want to know what that is, just wind back to last week's episode where we talk about that in a little bit more detail. Yeah. There you go. Little anchor. Check out 85. I've just realized that I've been playing with this coaster in my hands nearly the entire episode. If that's visible on camera, I apologize <laughs> to all of you who watch this on YouTube. So I bet it's damn distracting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and if you want one of these Camera Shake uh, podcast coasters, then uh, let us know. Send us, send us a message. If you've made it to this point in this episode, I'm, I'm pretty certain you could do with the Camera Shake um, coaster. So if you want oh, one yeah. of those, let us know. Um, and we would gladly send you one. Yeah, for a million dollars. <laughs> a million dollars. That's how, yeah, that's how unique they are. Anyway, <laughs> cool. That being said, that's episode 86. We'll see you again next week.